House, he braved the legislative session where he kept an eye on proposed laws that threatened the people's right to know. He continued to oversee the Montana Newspaper Association where he serves as executive director. And he survived a Lady Gaga concert in Las Vegas. When we invited him to this event, he made sure he, we knew that one, that what day he would be out of town seeing Lady Gaga and he would not compromise. Bear was a lifelong Montana resident. He started as a telegraph operator on the railroad in which he used the American version of Morse code. He jokingly calls out his days of using the Victorian internet. His adventures in journalism have taken him to Wolf Point Herald News. He served 12 years as publisher of the Revali Republic, five years as owner of the Buffalo Bulletin in Wyoming, and 16 years as publisher of the Dillon Tribune. He's been with the Montana Newspaper Association for almost six years. He and his wife, Roberta, now live in Helena. And I uh, kind of went over this last week with John, but uh, in all seriousness, every one of us in this room who love a free press, freedom of speech, owe John a big thank you for all the work he's done this past legislative session. Many times he was a lone speaker in the fight against bills that would make changes, large and small, to our way of life and the public's right to know. And I'd see him in the hallways of the Capitol sometimes, I swear he looked like Rocky Balboa in the 10th round. But he's still with us and I'd like to give John a hand for all he did for us this last session. I think we're set up for you here, John, unless you want to stand down there. Either way. We'll Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, last week we were in uh, Bozeman and we had a seminar for our newspaper editors and reporters and uh, we were very delighted to have Phil Drake as one of our presenters. And uh, Phil uh, started out on uh, dealing with investigative reporting, uh, primarily using electronic resources and ended up on a spirited uh, discussion on the one area of government that has no controls and that is tribal government and uh, the uh, federal laws don't apply and the state laws don't apply and uh, that became a, a really interesting discussion he did an excellent job on it we thank him for uh, leading the discussion that he probably hadn't planned on doing. I'm basically here today to talk about the interaction of uh, newspapers and blog sites. A lot of this has already uh, come about. Uh, I have sent out a, uh, a handout uh, with a very basic uh, Montana right to know law. Uh, we uh, have uh, uh, compiled all of the right to know laws that I can find uh, dealing with state and local government and they run about 80 pages of 12 point type uh, but these are the basics and, and what is basically predicated on I will refer you uh, I know we're going to have a freedom of information session coming up but I think that uh, uh, Montana's freedom of information is kind of a a special animal because it's one of only six states where the right to know is a constitutional right and it is the only state that has not uh, overly burdened it with a lot of exemptions uh, many states have statutory right to know laws that uh, have more holes than your spaghetti sieve uh, that uh, I was in Wyoming and I spent a great deal of my time sitting on the bumper of my car because they had so many exemptions to meetings. I go back so far that I started in this business when we were still using linotypes and Ludlow's and all of these old-fashioned printing techniques. And I go back so far that I predate the Montana Constitution, the new Constitution and the right to know law. And let me assure you, that although 
we had an open meeting law prior to 1972. It had no effect. We currently have, I believe, one of the finest constitutional rights to know of any state in the Union. And probably the one that is hardest to enforce. Because the only recourse is through district court. And that means that if you can't persuade them by the beauty of your expression on attempting to open a meeting or to obtain a record even though the law says you're entitled to it, then your only recourse is to sue. Now there is a law that's on the books that says that official misconduct uh, con is constituted when a public official refuses your, you your right to know. But a Supreme Court case 35 years ago denuded that and uh, uh, because they couldn't determine uh, what the legislators were actually talking about. So basically the only thing in Montana is you either have to raise hell or go to court. And it got more complicated because in a 2006 case in which we won, and as the director of the Montana Newspaper Association, I'm involved in many of the suits, either directly or indirectly, we won this case against the Billings School District. But because the Montana law says that attorney fees in a right to know case go to the plaintiff. And we have collected attorney fees many times. They came up with a loophole. If you file a declaratory judgment petition, then which asks the court to decide, the government entity becomes the plaintiff. And although we have not had any court uh, or attorney fees assessed against us uh, if we would lose, we don't get any if we win. Now, the Montana newspapers can take care of themselves. But of the lawsuits over the past 35 years that have been filed in the Supreme Court of Montana, there's about 80 of them that deal with right to know or public records. A fourth of them were filed by media. Everything else is by individuals, organizations, other governments, and associations. The right to know law is not the press's law, it's your law. And that's what we have to rigorously maintain. Now we made an effort this session to overturn that 2006 uh, ruling by the Supreme Court. We made it through 49 to 1 in the State Senate, died in the House in the committee. Uh, they had so many amendments tacked on to it that it reversed itself and uh, we had to work damn hard just to kill it and keep it tabled. So we'll try again, but uh, understand this is your law. And sometimes the only thing you can do is to sue. Now, we can help you. On the third page of this handout, there's an ad. And this is the Montana Freedom of Information Hotline. This is financed uh, by grants and by media donations. Uh, we employ Mike Malloy, who I believe is the finest Freedom of Information lawyer in Montana. And this is a free service to you. You call that number and uh, give the basic details. He will give you a solid legal opinion and if necessary will write a letter for you to get a record or open a meeting. Uh, if it goes to suit, you're on your own. 
but uh, he can assist you with recommendations of who in your area might be an attorney that is experienced in that. Right to know, of course, is the, the basis of all of our freedom of expression. Uh, the Constitution in Montana has four elements. One is the freedom of expression, which includes you and us as the press. Another is the right to know. The most important is the right to participate, because the right to participate is predicated upon the idea that you know what's going on. So these three elements then are balanced against a constitutional right of privacy. But that constitutional right of privacy is basically inferior to the other three because the Constitution says that you have a right to know unless the right of privacy clearly, triple underline, clearly exceeds the public's right to know. And what is happening now, at least in Montana, and it's certainly across the nation, and we ran into a number of laws that were predicated this, is that there is a propensity to reverse that order. That uh, individual privacy is now becoming ascendant. And we saw that over and over again in the legislature. And we had to work, and a lot of times it's just a matter of changing a word or getting the clause knocked out. But there is a definite propensity, and that does not bode well for professional journalists, nor for citizen journalists. So it, it is an area that you must be aware of, and it is a, a problem that affects us all. Now when we get to the interaction of uh, blogs and the newspaper, uh, Mr. Kagan practically said everything I'm going to say. And he's talking about professionalism. And that professionalism is our stock of trade as professional media. And it should be yours too. Uh, I have included in the last two pages the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. And these are voluntary. Papers don't have to follow it. But if you look at it, you can see where mostly they do. Now, the Society of Professional Journalists has also come up with a blogger's code of ethics that is included. And I think this highlights many of the things that Mr. Keegan was talking about and what members of the audience were talking about during the roundtable discussion. And it basically follows the two, the two, the professional journalists and the professional uh, bloggers uh, have been mingled there so that the same ideas are carried through. It is all a matter of trust. And there's quite a discussion on anonymity. And anonymity is probably the engine that drives uh, much of the internet uh, interaction. It also is the anchor that keeps it from being taken seriously. And you run into a danger that if you don't be careful and make sure that your sources are out there and that uh, when you get commentaries that uh, you have some sort of policy on your uh, commentary section. Because if you don't, you basically, at least in the minds of many people, become flax and hacks. And consequently, you must protect your reputation. And this is whether you're a newspaper or not. The lady mentioned the early years of journalism 
and with the anonymous sources. Now, I'm so old that uh, I have worked for newspapers that go back to the dawn of Montana and all their back issues. And at that time, the rule of newspapers was anonymity. And you had the sage of the beaver head, and you had the, the bandit guy, and you had all of these people that were doing everything anonymous. And it was very hard to tell the difference between an 1870 newspaper and a 2011 blog site. And in the process, journalism changed. And it changed right before the First World War. And it was, in a large extent, uh, dependent upon the excesses of the news coverage of the Spanish-American War and of the beginnings of the muckrake, muckrakers. And they're about 1912, 1913. Uh, the first journalism school was built. Does anyone know where the second journalism school was built in the United States? Missoula. Okay. We go really far back in the effort for professional journalism. And I look at the concept of professionalism as being basically a lady or a gentleman, that you get the facts, you get them out, but you put them out in such a way and you've gotten them in such a way that they are trusted and that they are respected and that they are believed. Now do all newspapers do that all the time? Things fall through the cracks, you bet. Several of the people in the room here uh, I've had long experiences with, uh, and I'm not going to mention anything about the blonde lady in the corner, uh, because she says, please don't, so I won't. Thanks. Yes. But she was a county commissioner, and we, we had our struggles over the years. But I think, I would like to think that in the end, whether or not she agreed, that Hopefully, my interactions with her were as professional as possible. Yes, they were. And that I think you need to strive for as bloggers. Basically, there's a little difference between blogging and journalism. The difference is the delivery. And I think that with the invention of the Internet, that you have really moved one segment within that First Amendment. You have moved from the freedom of press to the freedom of speech. Both are equally important, but there are different aspects. And as you become more professional blog, I think you actually become part of the press. Now, during uh, the interim session prior to <coughs> this legislature, there's always interim sex sessions. And one of those deals with the rules of the House and the Senate as to the conduct. And one segment of that always deals with what are you going to do with the press? And they came up with a rule that, would, uh, that deals primarily with the floor access of who, who is accessible. And when they started the rule, it was for accredited organizations. Now, there's no definition of what accredited is. But when we got through, we changed it to registered, which means you go up, you sign your name, you get your photo ID. And we specifically allow bloggers as part of the, the journalistic effort. And I think that's, that is an indication of how far you have come as importance in the uh, idea of media. 
and uh, uh, we were we were pleased to do that, and it was one of the suggestions that that we made. Uh, we uh, do have problems. Several of our newspapers have blogs, and the Missouri and Bob was mentioned, and that does cause this this problem because I think most of us consider our newspaper blogs to essentially be part of the paper, and therefore we try to to maintain those same standards. And then you come into the concept of anonymous commentary. Uh, the, the blogs are bylined, but the commentary often isn't. And it's this balancing act between trying to get people to respond and trying to maintain a level of, of responsibility and accountability. I personally, uh, as editor for over 35 years, had a basic rule that if you're not willing to put your name on it, I'm not willing to put my neck out. And so consequently, we did not take anonymous letters. And uh, we never did go into the commentary uh, section of, the, uh, of our website. But many have. And it is important and it's popular. What tends to, to happen, and Mr. Kagan really covered this, is that instead of information in light in your commentaries, you generally wind up with darkness and noise. And uh, it, it is a problem, and he's absolutely correct. It's basically all or nothing if you start to moderate. If you moderate it, you have taken, basically, the step towards editorial control. If you don't, you've left this thing out there. And uh, uh, so, so it's difficult. Uh, I've also included here the shield law that Mr. Keegan mentioned. Uh, it's very important. And uh, we utilized it just a few months ago on a blogging situation up at the Daily Interlake in Kalispell. And uh, the, uh, it was happened to be on a, uh, an automobile accident and death, and they were trying to get the uh, identities and information concerning the uh, uh, blogs that were run in the paper on it. And they were successful. And uh, they did appear in court, and they basically said, we have this blog, and that was that. And uh, they gave no information, and they protected the, the whole basis of that. Uh, so it, it does have teeth. I've used it probably six or seven times over my career, that uh, not so much uh, about what I printed, but if they wanted my notes, it was what I didn't print that I was most concerned about. So we're not at war each other, bloggers and newspapers, but we do have a very unusual kind of tete, I guess. And it is very upsetting to me uh, when uh, I would be in a town and, and the blogs were would just get crazy wild like on the city council or something. And just bananas. And then they say, well, why didn't you print that? Well, basically because it was crap. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to do that. And uh, so there is a relationship that does bounce back and forth on it. Uh, I must be about out of time. So if there's any questions or anything, I'd be glad to respond. Yes. There's a man I know very well. He's, he's been the Freedom of Information thing several times, Dan. Uh, the, the one question I have is in relation to uh, uh, notice of public meetings. I notice on, on your list here, you don't list uh, MCA code 7 17121 which requires that they publish notice of the meetings in the, in the local newspaper. 
Uh, they also have some other, if there is no paper in the adjoining <coughs> county and three public places. Uh, I also, I'm also finding now that what's happening is that we're looking at a transition period where they're saying, uh, rather than publishing it in the newspaper, that they're putting it on the internet. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, a lot of people still aren't on the internet. Uh, do you, what, is, what do you see as a transition, and what do you see as the applicable law? Okay. Uh, there are uh, lots of laws, okay? And uh, uh, if you would like a, a more complete copy, please email me at that MT News, and I'll give you the, the sites. I thought I had a, a link on here, but I did not. Um, it doesn't necessarily require published British notes. There are a number of ways that you can uh, be qualified as public notice. The surest way is to print that, but it's not always required, and many people do not, and many agencies do not. Is it moving that way? Several states have had some major fights. Uh, Utah lost its public notice to a government website and were able to get it back this year. Uh, Wisconsin is in a fight for their life right now. Uh, last two years, 14 states have, have battled that. Now we have, uh, although it's not perfect and we don't have all the papers on it yet, we do have a public notice website, and that's called publicnoticeads.com. And click on Montana, and we have uh, probably half of the papers uh, that list all of their public notice on, on the website. John, uh, Jim Ravidal here. You know, I, I was involved in, in the legislative process this year trying to get that bill through, and, and as understandably, we ended up having to do a lot of things to, to put it to sleep. Um, my question is, of course, I want to thank you for your resolve for fighting for the freedom of press and freedom of speech here. And do you have any uh, game plan right now with the session closing where we can look forward to getting on the war wagon, if you will, of fighting for this going through the interim and into the next session? Well, we would be glad to, to meet with, with anyone that is interested. We're definitely going to go on that law again. We're definitely going to bring a couple other ones up. This was my very first attempt at trying to actually pass a law. And uh, it's harder to pass than to kill. And, uh, and we learned and, and got a little complacent when we did so well in the Senate. Didn't see that one representative that was sitting out there. And uh, by the time we figured out the argument, it basically was too late. So we had to go from there. Is there any law that covers the legal validity of, like, for example, minutes that are um, posted to the internet and taken off the internet by a local government? Like, for example, their minutes, you take them off the internet. Are they legally valid? Well, as, as long as as there's an official uh, copy of it someplace uh, so that you can prove. Uh, yes, there's nothing that says they can, and we recommend that they do. They are required, uh, no longer required to put them in the paper. They haven't had to do that for 30 years. But they are required to put a notice that they are available. And there are many counties that don't do that. They have to make the minutes publicly available within 21 days on the county level. I'm, I'm just kind of trying to refer to if we've had instances where they've come up changed. Come up changed. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. From what was on the internet to later an issue will arise in their different Well, never run into that or what I, I haven't, but but that would be tampering in there and that would probably be, be misconduct, I would think. And thank you very much. Oh, it's John? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Um, you know, when you say they don't have to, there's nothing in there that says they have to. I think that's the problem now. We're getting these elected officials that are supposed to be representing us that worm their way out of doing it. I would think it would be they want to notify the people of it. I go to my Uncle Guido. You know, if I'm having a wedding and I want Uncle Guido to be there, I'm going to send him an invitation with directions a month in advance. But if I don't want Uncle Guido to be there, I'm going to send it to him the day after the wedding. And this is basically what I find. I get this, we don't have to do that. Well, I voted for you, and you're supposed to do it, whether the law says so or not. Yeah. The, the law says that there has to be public notice. Uh, where, where the discussion really is, is what constitutes that public notice. And there are some segments of public notice that are specified. There has to be a published uh, notice in, in the newspaper of the county. There are others that say uh, that, that there are other alternatives. What happens is if there is a problem uh, and somebody challenges that meeting on the open meeting statute, if there wasn't a published notice, in the paper, then it is up to the government to prove the adequacy of its public notice on all other aspects. 